información, entonces con el Kirby nos va a leer un trabajo en inglés. En inglés sí. Kirby uh, presentado en español, pero me falta mucho en español en estos días, entonces, perdón, pero voy a presentarme y despertando en tiempos oscuros. Se llama. Y además ya han como aguantado mi español. <risa> <risa> Sobre todo fascismo y el sufrimiento de una espiritualidad en la perspectiva de una nueva sensibilidad. Sí. En la uh, 1960s. Uh, okay. In the 1960s, Herbert Marcuse recognized that there was a growing gap between the radicals and the, and the uh, masses in the United States. He worried that this gap was not going to close for a new fascist era had begun in the United States, especially. The problem that he had was that uh, the capacity that fascism had to incorporate a non fascist majority. So, fascism doesn't have to have fascist people. Uh, in it, it just has to have the vast majority participate in it. In other words, fascism relies on a, on a conformism and an indifference in the masses. What Marcuse called an inhuman silence. In our own time, fascist tendencies are emerging. In the United States is an obvious example, also lately in Brazil and in other parts of the world as well. Uh, my paper asks, what if within this fascist tendency of the majority We also see the opposite in the psychology of, of that fascist, fascist majority. Um, not the opposition that we see, obviously, in the radicals who oppose it explicitly by marching in the streets and not keeping quiet, but what if we see it in the vast majority who have within them a quiet search for something bigger? So what I wanted to do in my paper was to look at a vague va uh, mass movement that I place admittedly in a generalized term as new spiritualism or eco-spirituality. It's a vague collection of people who adopt all manner of spiritual practices to try to cope with their lives living in a destructive society. They adopt uh, practices from uh, Eastern religions like Taoism and Buddhism. Um, yoga is big in this, in, this movement, in this movement, so is meditation and meditative retreats. Uh, the appropriation of indigenous healing practices is also uh, a main practice amongst uh, this group. And business is booming in these practices in North America, in Canada, and the United States that I know of. And I don't want to dismiss these just because of the commodification and the conformism that we can immediately see in the groups. So the question then is what, if any, elements of a revolutionary consciousness are present in such individuals. So I look at the structure of the psyche of the revolutionary subject as Marcuse laid it out to see if we can see any hints of it in these people. Um, because as Marcuse had it, the roots of revolutionary change in society do, does not lie in the institutions or in basic institutional change, but it lies in changes within the individuals themselves. Real change, he said, is not possible without a change in the character structure of the individuals in the society. In other words, <coughs> an insti instinctual change is what's needed. The goal of real or radical change in any social movement that purports to real change, in Marcuse's own words, is the emergence of human beings who are physically and mentally incapable of inventing another Auschwitz. So the context that gives rise to the need for an instinctual revolt or the context that gives rise to an actual instinctual revolt is what is important to consider. So the context capable of producing another Auschwitz is the same that produces the fascist tendencies that we see today. In Marcuse's last speech, he described this context as one in which violence is both open and legitimate. What he meant by this is not so much um, the explicit violence that turns that repulses most people, the, um, the violence of femicides or the violence of mass shootings, but the structural and institutional violence that doesn't often go by the name violence. The violence we don't often call by its name because our lives depend on it, and our living conditions depend on it. Um, the examples that Marcuse gave were the pollution of the and devastation of the environment, 
and the continued subordination of humans and non-human animals and the ecological system to the requirements of the capitalist system. To see how this violence can be so open and legitimate, we have to look at the character structure that goes with it. In other words, every society has a dominant character structure. And it's often said that the character structure that's dominant to capitalism is greed or egoism. But as Max Weber had pointed out in his study of Protestant work ethic, greed and egoism is not unique to capitalism, and it actually can be a hindrance to capitalism. Because capitalism requires people to uh, watch their behavior and check their greed. The Frankfurt School had said that individualism is not uh, a unique feature of capitalism, but conformism. It's highly conformist because it's very effective at manipulating people's needs. And conformist needs that are produced within the system are, are um, highly effective at supplanting the emancipatory needs. Some of the examples of emancipatory needs that Marcuse had pointed out are the need for humans to be free of unnecessary, to unnecessary toil and labor, free of unnecessary stress, uh, to find peace and quiet and solitude in their lives. And another emancipatory need is the end of role playing and the end of pretending. So living in a conformist world where toil is a need, survival depends on personal responsibility. So in addition to conformism, the capitalist society is a society that's characterized by widespread coldness and indifference to others. And this is the defining feature of capitalism. It's not the greed or the egoism, but the coldness and indifference and conformism. Capitalist society produces, in Adorno's words, people who are incapable of looking suffering in the eye. In other words, they look away because they don't want to face it. They can't, they can't face it. Coldness is the precondition of fascism and the basic principle of bourgeois subjectivity. And Frankfurt School had pointed out how it was a basic condition for Auschwitz, indifference to the suffering of others. So there, these elements, conformism and coldness or indifference, are central features of this destructive character structure. Opposed to this is a radical character structure. Um, and this character structure is almost the virtual opposite. It's all about the search for authenticity and deep connection beyond the self. If we can define new spiritualism in the most general way possible, I would put it as such. I see eco-spirituality or the new spiritualism as a search for new or deep connections beyond the self, beyond the isolated ego. It's often said that people are trying to connect with the self beyond consciousness. The satisfaction of desires in the system is not enough, and people are seeking out something bigger. And it's important to know that these movements often come from the middle class, so their many of their um, their uh, needs are satisfied to a certain degree. Let us look at. So then, I want to move to look at deep ecology's self-definition, how it describes itself. It sees itself as an education aimed at cultivating post-human sensibilities. They speak of a psycho-spiritual dimension, an eco-self, a self that identifies with nature, or Gaia, or Pachamama. The eco-self is a self beyond the ego-self. This identification or connection with nature is spoken of as something that occurs through deeply embodied psycho-spiritual experiences of the natural world and of our bodies. They don't see it as a worldview, or something intellectual like a mode of thought, but as a mode of perception that emerges from below through intuitions. They talk of it as an ecological consciousness, or an ecological unconsciousness striving to become conscious through the ego. And this causes people to seek new ways of experiencing and relating to the world. So might we say then that the changed consciousness, as deep ecology sees it, happens through what Marcuse called a new sensibility. Deep ecology and deep spiritualisms are often dismissed within leftist circles. And we can see this clearly in the debate that happened through the 1980s and 90s between deep ecology and social ecology, which was a Marxist-inspired um, understanding of ecology. And 
the, mark, the social ecology deeply criticized the, the, the deep ecology movement as even bordering on fascist, fascism itself. But I think there's something uh, we can also learn from them in the, same, in the same way that Marcuse wanted us to learn something from the hippies who could no longer tolerate the conditions they lived under under capitalism and saw something different. Marcuse said that the emancipatory tendency today appears as a primary rebellion of mind and body, of consciousness and unconsciousness. In other words, it wasn't the, the emancipatory tendency is not just a raising of consciousness or a raising um, of a clear mind as to what exactly is happening. It's something embodied. The central feature of this emancipatory tendency, Marcuse pointed out in his last speech, was a return to oneself. The connection to a self beyond the self requires self-work. Marcuse said that these groups, who he was looking at in the 1960s, um, of, the, of the New Left, have a preoccupation with their own psyche, with their own drives, and with self-analysis. As long as these groups uphold a turn to the self in their desire for identification with nature, they already hold the semblance of a potential for revolutionary action. As long as they're concerned with the source of their feelings, with their ideas being their own, then the source for legitimate action becomes less about conformism and more uh, a more authentic source. Self-work is not the same as egoism. And it seeks a higher stage of awareness, or even what we could call a sublation of the ego. When, and through a move through which the ego is not destroyed. Uh, though these movements, for the most part, are apolitical, when the individual's own experiences are central, we are only one step away from the politics of the first person, which is how Marcuse described it in his last speech, speaking about the revolutionary or the, the revolt, the groups that were revolting in the 1960s. So, I want to conclude though on a cautionary note, because though I'm a, I'm I'm slightly optimistic about the potential that lies within these groups. I think that um, critical ther theory demands that we're uh, that we be pessimistic about, about their potential as well. Marcuse never thought that the hippies could ever be a revolutionary subject, but they did reveal a new sensibility that was unable to go along with the destructive society. So, to deepen my cautionary embrace of them, of these movements, I turned to Adorno in his essay on astrology, uh, which he titled The Stars Down to Earth. He wrote that mass movements like astrology are mixtures of irrational and rational elements. The rational elements in movement, mass movements like astrology are that, in a sense, they deal with and help people with everyday practices, everyday practical, practical problems. In this way, the rationality is the same as the kind of rationality that in magic it is like a technology that helps people cope and with their egoistic goals, collective or individualistic. The irrational element is that they, these mass movements entail blind acceptance to authority, to a creed that presupposes and accepts the suffering of the individual who demands astrology as the answer to their problems. It accepts their anger, their sadness, their angst, their despair. In short, it accepts their alienation. And it doesn't penetrate it. It doesn't question it. So astrology is irrational because the individual's experiences come second to the authority of the guru or the astrologist. And the conformism comes first. It's what Ordono calls secondary superstition. And the fear, as you can probably um, anticipate is that these social movements, the eco-spiritual spiritual movements, are also uh, based in secondary superstition. As long as these social movements, deep ecology and spiritualism, eco-spiritual, eco-spirituality, cause people to relate to each other through objectified social processes, or in other words, through the market, through books, through lectures, um, and the authority of the guru's message prevents individuals from having critical control over their own experiences, the people who follow these movements will be alienated from their experiences.
because in times of angst and confusion that we're living through today, anyone who can accurately describe your feelings will appear to you as almost as God's own prophet, um, telling you exactly how you're feeling and where your feelings are coming from. The problem is that it will it often, in these movements, lacks an objective criticism of the society that produces the, those people who feel this way. So as long as social movements offer short-term relief, while failing to consider the source of their angst in social structures, objective social structures, these will be, in short, alienated movements. Thank you.
¿Qué, qué potencial eh, revolucionario realmente crees que tengan esta, estos movimientos? Eh, porque mi hermana, por ejemplo, es instructora de yoga, es sordo, eh, y aunque es muy buena en eso, eh, socialmente es esta parte de no hay que ver las noticias porque nos afecta emocionalmente, no hay que hacer esto porque nos afecta emocionalmente. Y eh, ahorita no recuerdo que, qué autora es que habla de la del de capitalismo de las emociones y entonces de valorizar la racionalidad eh, y únicamente quedarnos con la emoción de eh, no me gusta eh, me aíslo ¿no? y ya no hay una crítica y un enfrentamiento hacia esa parte social que provoca eso que no me gusta no, Uh, I, I don't remember the, the name of the author, uh, but she talks about the capitalism of emotions. And she says that uh, rationality is devalorized because uh, it's not um, as important as emotions. And so uh, if you confront uh, uh, the social Uh, structure and, and the policies and, and all the problems, then you are going to feel that. Yeah. And so you say, no, I better uh, turn it out. Yeah, yeah, it's to drop away from it. Uh -huh. um, where is the problem? Especially in the, in, the, in the mass movements of like uh, meditation and yoga, I see uh, they're utterly unstable entirely for the same reason, I think. But at the same time, um, I can't help but follow Marcuse when he says that there, a qualitatively different type of society than we have today is not possible unless we have qualitatively different types of people. And if the vast majority of people are not radical, and they don't have uh, critical thought as a, as a weapon, I think we still have to look for hints of it in the masses of people. And this, this I see as a, as a movement, obviously, that comes out of, out of a destructive society. Um, but maybe the answer then is, is to think about how to make contact with, with those movements, how to make contact with them, and uh, not let them be isolated from radical thought. I'm not sure, but <laughs> but I think they, they need to be politicized. The, the emotions need to be politicized. But the, the move towards the first person is what Marcuse said was a, was almost an essential move towards the creation of a new society. Because then the next step is to politicize the, the first person. Yeah, I think um, does that make sense? <laughs> Este, la pregunta para este, Rodney, ¿sí en español así de, de despacio? Sí, de despacio. Okay. Eh, bueno, o sea, como que Marcuse ya, no sé, hombre dimensional, eh, está preguntando justamente sobre estos temas, ¿no? Dice, bueno, tienes a los hippies en movimiento beat, usan drogas para potenciar tu sensibilidad, y, y eso está bien, eh, es bien legítimo, ¿no? Como tú lo eh, mencionabas. El problema es precisamente, bueno, precisamente estos movimientos, o sea, no se separan precisamente del consumo de mercancías o de la aceptación del status quo como algo eh, inevitable. Lo, lo mismo eh, con respecto eh, al yoga, o sea, como que cultura beat, cultura eh, pachamama, eh, cultura yoga, eh, de facto sería eh, un problema a nivel, digamos, eh, táctico, si la propuesta, por así decirlo, de nueva estructuración de la sensibilidad o nueva relación con la naturaleza no pasa por la crítica de la forma mercancía. O sea, como que esa es una ecuación básica que Marcos se detecta en los, en los ejemplos. ¿no? Eh, nuevas propuestas, ¿no? de nueva sensibilidad, nueva relación a la naturaleza, pero que se conformen o acepten la forma mercancía van a ser necesariamente reaccionarias. O sea, como que eso lo acaba evidenciando, o sea, la necesidad de la crítica al capital 
como algo necesario para animar cualquier movimiento político. O sea, como decir, de, bueno, si tuviéramos esto, nueva sensibilidad, eh, una relación a la naturaleza tipo Pachamama, más crítica a la mercancía, más rechazo al Estado, ahí habría una buena eh, alternativa política, ¿no? O sea, como que a esa no renunció nunca a Marcuse, eh, me parece. Eh, bueno, eso como un pequeño comentario, ¿no? Eh, en, en ese sentido creo que ahí concuerdo con lo que presentas eh, me pregunto lo siguiente o sea, con respecto a estos movimientos de la nueva espiritualidad movimientos de Pachamama si pensando con Marcus o sea, no pudiera haber una contribución no sé, filosófica, teórica que evitar estos movimientos o a estas propuestas a pensar en alguna concepción digamos dialéctica, filosófica sobre la sociedad, la cultura que al final de cuentas pudiera integrar vaya, conceptos científicos, metafísicos, psicoanalíticos, para construir un programa racional de eh, reacción práctica frente a los problemas de las sociedades actuales. ¿no? O sea, no es no, nada no, por la sola forma, ¿no? Si, si no le faltara a estos movimientos actuales algo de conocimiento científico, filosófico y psicoanalítico para que pudieran ser empleables en un sentido emancipatorio. Considerando igualmente que si falta ciencia, filosofía y psicoanálisis en estos nuevos movimientos de pachamama, nuevas subjetividades, pues no va a cambiar nada y eso haría que los movimientos fueran reaccionarios y que uno desde la filosofía los tuviera que criticar eh, tajantemente. No sé cómo es esta última eh, parte, o sea, esa es la como pregunta. <risa> No, no, no. Well, would, 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 uh, philosoph would do you think uh, that philosophy, psychoanalysis, and science, I mean physics, biology, yeah. uh, that if one studies these sciences, one could get a better view of the world and have a better practical proposal? That's my question. Yes, I think so for sure. I think this is the answer. The critical theory has to be brought to bear on these groups. So when, when Marcuse saw hints of this in his hippies, all he was looking at was this little hint. Like there's something there. Uh, they cannot tolerate uh, the destruction. They can't live in this type of society. So they leave it. And they leave it behind for something else. And uh, but they don't have they don't have the tools of critical thought because they don't criticize the objective structures of the society and uh, to penetrate the real sources of their feelings which is in the social institutions themselves and the hierarchy. So, uh, yeah, I think it's impossible without critical thought. It'll still be a superstitious world if we all just became and followed these movements. It would be, it still would be, it would lack enlightenment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gracias. Eh, mi pregunta es para Julia. Decías en tu ponencia que cuando criticabas las eh, formas de psicoterapia convencional, ¿no? que se construye un marco ¿no? de objetividad del psicoterapeuta para no involucrarse ¿no? de forma objetiva con el eh, no sé si paciente es la palabra. Que <risa> Es cierto. Eh, entonces, <risa> mi pregunta es eh, si tienes alguna noción de cómo sería una psicoterapia que se involucre y los límites que eso tendría que tener por qué es peligroso. O sea, es una noción peligrosa lo que está sufriendo. ¿no? ¿Cómo lo ves? Eh, sí, claro, sin el perdón, está, es peligroso, este, este marco también es como, tiene una historia y no se hizo por nada, porque si sí, en cada momento, ah, como lo comentaste, este, no, pues si sí, en cada momento intentaríamos como ser solidarios porque queremos, nos aguantamos, pues no, 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 no lo aguantamos porque hay demasiadas cosas que, que apoyar, que luchar para, no, pues, sí, sí, claro. Pero pues um, un ejemplo es de, de una terapeuta con raíces del de Irán que también tenía como un usuario o refugiado de su país, ¿no? Y dice, wow, ¿sabes qué? Este es un comentario, un 
comentario eh, a raíz de la intervención del compañero o sea, no de las, no de las... Eh, pero sí, por supuesto tiene que ver generalmente pensamos y lo he pensado casi toda la vida en términos catastrofistas es uno de los catastróficos, es decir, y pensamos, cuando pensamos en la actualidad, en una crisis civilizatoria, conceptualizada así por Bolívar Echeverría, tenemos una crisis civilizatoria, es decir, ¿qué quiere decir esto? Que es un, una experiencia de acabamiento, pero creo que también es una experiencia, o que esa experiencia de acabamiento, que es lo dominante, implicaría experiencias de resistencia, por supuesto de nueva es que no me gustaría hablar de nueva sensibilidad sino además, sino quizá de sensibilidades agazapadas, sensibilidades eh, latentes sensibilidades que estaban ahí, no necesariamente vistas desde el pachamamismo no necesariamente quizás se han asociado al pachamamismo porque es un vehículo muy inductivo ¿sí? y, 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 y le pega a un lado de la sensibilidad eh, que a lo mejor no podemos resistir mucho pero es una pregunta que no se encuentra para que empezamos a ella eh, quizás estas nuevas sensibilidades si es que realmente las hay como efecto de esta crisis civilizatoria que rompe el cascarón ¿sí? que rompe eh, una, una una, decía Lucas, la cáscara cósmica haga que, que, que se o se renueven o re, se reconstruyan sensibilidades que a lo mejor estaban latentes, dormidas no necesariamente pachamamistas es decir, otro tipo de relación entonces eh, a ver, lo digo porque soy contemporáneo de los hippies ¿sí? y, y, y hippies sí eh, procuraban una, una sensibilidad como tú dices vehiculada a través de, 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 de drogas de otro tipo de experiencias pero es que la experiencia misma del, del rompimiento de esa cáscara cósmica a lo mejor no la hemos pensado muy a fondo vamos, lo dejo así y, y les damos las gracias Gracias. <laughs>